All right. Uh, so we'll kick off today's session. So just good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's member lean-in. Hope you're all doing well today and apologies for the time zone confusion. Um, thank you for the, taking the time to attend transitioning to 3D CAD systems and solutions. Uh, Mark and Peter will be your presenters from QI for today's member lean-in. So I've just got a few housekeeping rules. Uh, if you could just put, put any questions oh. that you have. Oh. Sorry, yes. I was thinking, um, people, well, people, if they want to keep their cameras on, we can do that today. And then if we have an internet instability, we, we can pop them off. But it might be nice for Mark and Peter to see people while they're presenting. And it seems quite stable. Yep, sure. Sorry for interrupting. So we've just got a few housekeeping rules. If we could pop any questions into the chat so Mark and Peter are able to answer your questions at the end. We'll allocate 10 to 15 minutes for this. Um, if you could have your camera on, it's more personable for the uh, for Mark and Peter. So uh, we'll, we'll, this will be recorded as well. So we're able to put this on YouTube and this will go out in our newsletter. So Peter has pop, uh, popped some links for QR into the chat for people to access the later date. And thank you. I'll hand over to Mark and Peter now. Good morning. How are we all? So your question is, who am I? Well, I'm an architect just like you guys. Um, uh, I'm not used to presenting to big groups like this. Well, I'm, I'm used to a group of 20 because uh, I'm in the architect small practice group. So oh, I've got someone's mic on. Um, so I'm used to presenting to 20 people, but not uh, Zoom live to a whole bunch. So uh, bear with me. This is a brand new presentation. So uh, I guess the question is, uh, why are you here today? Um, uh, obviously to work out how to master Revit faster or, or transition from 2D CAD to 3D BIM. The first thing we need to work out is um, just where you sit on the Moore's curve. Um, I've modified this little Moore's curve and turned it into a dinosaur. And uh, probably some of you are sitting at the chasm there, you're all familiar with this, um, between the early adopters and the um, early majority. Um, so I'll ask you to put in the chat box whether you're still on the drawing board or using 2D CAD or 3D CAD or full, full BIM. Um, that's actually um, where what this is all about because this is my, my story of how I got from the drawing board to um, here. If you are on ArchiCAD or something else like that, um, this is specifically about Revit, but a lot of the principles uh, still actually apply. Uh, I'm, not, I'm familiar with um, SketchUp and ArchiCAD and some of these, but Basically, um, the ideas are uh, transferred across to those other that other software. Hey, Mark, I can tell you now the the chat box. It's an interesting mix of people. I'm actually fascinated. Um, some ArchiCAD, one or two SketchUps, lots and lots of 2D, Chief Architect, a few on Revit. It's actually a mix across everything. Um, yeah, so it's it's yeah, it's it's everything. Okay, well, thanks for those responses. Okay, so uh, why listen to me? Uh, you can look at that photo uh, there. That's my early days of um, uh, starting off with CAD, the old classic 13-inch uh, VDU, which I was so impressed. It was such a massive screen. And uh, back then, it was uh, $400 for four megabytes. So for those younger people out there, that's megabytes, not gigabytes. So uh, the computers were so slow back then, I'd actually draw on the drawing board uh, types of information into uh, one computer and then type it into the other. And while it was thinking about the answer, I was drafting on my drawing board. So uh, been around there for a long time. I've had my own practice for 30 years. That's probably closer to 40 now. Um, I'm a fellow of the Institute of Architects and some of you may have um, seen, I actually contribute a fair bit on the uh, online forum. The, again, the Architect Small Practice Group had an online forum for quite a while. And uh, so that's where we started this whole attitude of um, sharing with my um, compatriots. I um, had been doing 2D CAD for 25 years and 3D CAD for 15 plus. Do um, domestic, commercial, industrial projects generally under 10 million. Started off on childcare centres and now I'm doing funeral homes, funnily enough. So the classic cradle to grave architect, I suppose you could call me. Uh, anyway, this is my story about um, where I started from. Um, and uh, generally, I, when I came into AutoCAD, there was a lot of, uh, of add-ons um, to AutoCAD itself. And um, I found this process uh, long, painful and arduous. Um, and I want to try and be your sat nav today to get you to... Um, destination BIM City. 
So for those of you that are old enough, remember the old um, drawing boards. I actually started on drawing board, not even with one of these machines, but T-squares on it, would you believe, on tracing paper. And uh, back then we were actually uh, standing up all day, ironically. In Brisbane, it was uh, very hot and uh, uh, hard and sticky to work on tracing paper. It would actually move about 10 millimetres uh, during the day, which is a metre on site, one is to 100. So uh, hatching was absolutely a real pain, hated that. And making changes was pretty difficult uh, too. I'm scratching out the tracing paper and you know, humidity would go straight through and you'd have to come up with all sorts of manners to use it. So when digital came along, I was um, all ready to embrace it and move to something a bit easier uh, than what I was working on at the time. So TDK came along. It was not as good as I'd hoped it would be. Uh, it was more accurate, it was easy to change and amend and it was a little bit more portable. But the hardware was expensive, extremely slow. The software was expensive. The um, you know, backup was pretty bad and the productivity was not real good during the learning curve. So uh, very quickly, I actually decided to go um, straight to 3D CAD essentially, um, but it wasn't really 3D CAD. It was essentially extruded lines. The very first iterations were not walls, but extruded lines. And uh, I kept going to the uh, add-on company and kept breaking their software all the time, doing stuff that, and I'd go to all their uh, sales pitches and say, does this work now? And they'd all go, yep. And I'd say, show me, and of course it wouldn't work. So in the end, I became a beta tester for them. So my job was to break it, which I did at monotonous regularity. Um, and then eventually, once Autodesk decided they, they wanted to sell, first of all, the architectural desktop, and uh, then uh, Revit, they actually tried to stop all the add-ons uh, working. So slowly but surely, uh, despite LISP routines, which I ran for about five years, they stopped working, so I had to move. I decided to, um, uh, and the very last one was um, Envisioneer, which actually was really a real 3D, except it didn't automate the update the views. You had to manually update everything. So it was a bit of a pain. Hey, but the good thing I got to sit down and work 15 hours a day sitting down. Uh, that, that's uh, of course until my back went out. So you know how you slump and it's just no good for your back. So I put my computer up on my drawing board and it's been there ever since. Um, so again, in the chat room, it'd be really good if you guys could take the trouble to feed in. Let's know that if you're um, sitting at a, uh, a normal desk or have a standing desk, but sit down or stand at a standing desk all day. Uh, I've been doing it for 25 years and um, now I'm getting a bit old. I get a bit tired, I actually perch on a hairdresser's stool. So uh, it was the best thing I could find. It was just the right height and keeps your back nice and straight. So there's a tip, find a good hairdresser's stool. Most of them are too low, but if you get one high enough, it's quite good. Now, I want to talk about um, selling design. So Pete's pointed out we've got some people on um, SketchUp and some other products uh, out there. And um, to me, I'm very interested in finding uh, what people are doing because some people are still doing hand-drawn sketches. Uh, some people are outsourcing perspectives from overseas and coming back and then starting the whole process over again for their designs. Some people are using uh, uh, um, 2D initially and so forth. So. I'll come back and touch on that, but I just think it's interesting to look at what's actually happening out there. I think you need to start on the one bit of software and continue it through, because that's the most cost effective uh, way of doing it, in my humble opinion. In terms of documentation, um, three options there, your 2D, uh, 3D and 3D uh, converted to 2D. Interesting enough, that still happens quite a lot. Uh, a lot of structural drawings are actually all 3D and converted back to um, 2D. Uh, in fact, I had um, a process once where the shop drawings were kept coming back wrong all the time. And the guy said, no, no, we've modeled it in 3D, it's correct. So I imported his into mine and found that it was actually correct. When they were printing it out, for some reason, it just made a mistake and moved the steel work. So, uh, that's, that's a real nuisance. Anyway, here's key tip number one. To harness the power of 3D, BIM modeling, everything should be in 3D. Everything. Um, no 2D stuff should be avoided just because there's too many problems. Let's talk about BIM and what is BIM. So I created this little model, a uh, little diagram here to show where BIM sits in the order of things. And you can see it's the center of design and building and operating, and maintaining and construction. If it's the architects, the facilitators, construction managers, operation maintenance, all sits in there. And BIM, BIM is the center of everything and it is the way of the future. If all the information is actually in the model. 
Now, um, it's going to be mandatory and the government's slowly making it more and more mandatory and our um, private enterprise people will require that as well. I think part of the problem at the moment is um, there's just no interoperability between different bits of software. So quite often it's um, if you convert from ARCHICAD to an, ICF, an IFC file and vice versa, you lose a lot of that uh, information that's actually in the model. So once you lose the information in the model and it's just uh, it's, it's quite meaningless, and I think that's part of the problem. I think I'll overcome that problem. It's a bit like um, WordPerfect and uh, Word. Eventually, you'll be able to swap them and keep the information, but that's going to be the key to it. Why do governments want to legislate for all this? Well, a lot of it's based on operational management. So when they can see what they're actually doing and go back and um, update their files and link the new ones in. But as I say, that's, there's still some hiccups there and we're probably a few years away from it being somewhat seamless. Certainly, um, by the time it's legislated, it won't be seamless. Um, a lot of people see it as really good for clash detection for all disciplines, electrical, and mechanical, uh, hydraulic, and things like that. And again, I found that pretty good. But again, I find that if I do incorporate uh, my consultant's 3D files, invariably I find mistakes in there because they do it in 3D and convert it to 2D. And invariably I got to go back and say, why is this wrong in 3D? Um, but for me, it's a different thing. To me, the power is in the virtual, the virtual reality of it. Um, BIM is a design tool. In the past, uh, I used to work a lot on um, tracing paper and um, oftentimes it, I'd actually drop it and it would fall on the floor. And as I was picking it up, I'd go, oh, that's interesting. I never really thought about looking at it like that. So it gave me a different perspective and quite often was uh, a different design that I had imagined. I use uh, BIM exactly the same way. I use all the flexibility that's in the software to move it around not only to look at it, but to use the parameters in it to change things to come up with, with the design, the best design that I can. So the question is, why is BIM so uncommon? So in Revit, I uh, apologize to the people that don't use uh, Revit, but in Revit, the content there are basically called families. Um, and so um, when, you, when you first learn Revit, I know it's the same in the other software, but um, you learn how to make uh, make the families, the walls, the doors, the windows, and so on and so forth. And uh, of course, we're all architects, so our egos take over, and we think that we can design uh, a, a better window or door or a better product than anyone else out there. And uh, of course, we go on the internet and share it with everybody. And ultimately, the, on Google, everything stays there. So um, the rubbish stays online forever, which makes it even harder to find actual good content. Um, that's a real problem. So with, in Revit, um, the parameters are the actual key, and it's probably it's the same in uh, other software from what I can gather. If you have one window that's 12 by 12 and you want to make a 12 by 24, rather than making a sec second window, you use the parameters to um, you do these different instances of the same product. Um, and that's really good. It saves um, um, bloating up um, your, all your files. I've actually seen one guy that came up with a window and door that will do every window and door you ever wanted, but it had about 200 parameters and took about four hours to work out to get the window you wanted. So you've got to find that sweet spot uh, in between. Uh, so you end up with just uh, the right number of uh, families that you need. Uh, manufacturers content is another option. Um, slowly but surely, manufacturers are coming on more and more online, uh, saying that they're giving us content uh, to make our job easier so we specify their products. What I have found is um, now oftentimes the uh, Revit files are actually CAD files that have been imported into a Revit. And that's actually pretty useless, the same as having a PDF document incorporated into, uh, into a Word document. It's got no flexibility and it's not no use to you. There's no information as such. Um, and of course, you've got to go through the process of uh, registering with them to show that you're not a spammer and then get your password and then you can get, finally get access to it. And invariably, you can download it uh, if you're lucky as a um, as a zip file, uh, but then once you get there, you've got to you've got to find somewhere to put it, so you can unzip it, so you can actually uh, then put it somewhere you can find it again, and then of course you've got to go through the updating pains when it's um, if it's in Revit, it's not backwards compatible, so if it's newer than the license you're on, it won't open. If it's older, you have to wait for it to upgrade, uh, so that's a bit of a pain, and then invariably it's in a farm, so you've got to um, farm delivery system or something where you did stop doing years ago, it was about five or six years ago we were using it, but you've got to zoom in and find the thing that you want and then drop that into your project and go through the updating and so forth. Um, and then of course, uh, invariably there's no materials assigned to those particular claddings or products. And so you have to go through the manual process of doing that as well. 
and, and as soon as something changes, um, you've got to go back and do it again. And finally, last but not least, uh, often the cladding or product, the brick or whatever, just comes as a single skin brick or a bit of cladding, which to us as uh, architects is pretty useless. If you want to save us time, give it to us on a wall that we typically use so we can actually model straight away and not have to build the rest of the rest of the uh, Revit family um, ourselves. Okay, so other transition problems. Now, Revit is sort of a bit like Excel. It's pretty useless without a good library or a good template. And uh, we all use Excel. We know that um, the better it is and the more tabs you have, the more useful it is. Um, now, unfortunately, what that means is before to do anything simple, you need lots of windows and doors and walls and things like that. So you spend years and years compiling a really, really good library. And what I found that uh, once you do that, um, you won't share it with anybody. And what I found very, very frustrating as an architect is none of my architect friends would share any of their Revit stuff or any of the templates or help with anything. And that was very disappointing, particularly coming from uh, Architect Small Practice Group where we share quite a lot of stuff. No one was really on, into it there, but um, no one would share. So it's a question for you morally. If you spent all that time, would you actually share with anyone? Now, again, the most important thing is setting up a, uh, a file, a file structure, some kind of um, tree content so you can actually save those zip files, find it again, and so that the same people in your practice are not doing exactly the same thing and all wasting, uh, wasting multiple amounts of time uh, finding, downloading and updating um, uh, several things for the library. So it's a, ma a management issue. Some people think the solution is to uh, actually add the library um, to the template itself because that way it saves all those problems. But invariably the uh, library ends up being massive because you end up saying, oh, I might use that next time and that and so forth. So you end up with this huge, uh, huge template. Now rabbit files themselves are quite large um, and you still keep adding stuff to it, just bloats the template ends up being a massive, massive file. Uh, and invariably that slows you down because in fact, when you go to try and find something in Revit itself, the preview is fairly small and the uh, process is not very uh, user friendly. The interface is not very nice for actually finding something. So um, you spend forever looking at and invariably go back and uh, download it down again and only to be told it's already in there. So what is the answer to all this? Well, we talked about sourcing good three content. So, um, if you can source three good content, it's then actually put in a logical taxonomy, which essentially is a fam uh, some kind of tree, structural tree, where you can actually go find that again. I suggest the before you actually do anything, you start up with something like this. Um, I basically emulate the standard um, uh, one that comes with Revit, and but without their product metric products in it, I've started up my own, and you can drop your zip files there. And once you actually find something, you can drop them back in the same place. So you can actually uh, search and find it uh, every time. It'd be good if you could actually preview that through your um, fire inspection structure. And it'd be good if you could have uh, version auto detect because again, it's a pain having to update each time. Um, and also auto texture assignment, which I talked about. Now there are some file management, quite a few file management uh, systems which are coming to the market these days. A lot of smoke and mirrors on some of them. A lot of them just don't do a lot of the stuff that they say they do. Uh, and in particular, a lot of them um, won't actually open up uh, system files, which in Revit is um, a wall with cladding and plasterboard and shedding. A lot of them will just open up the cladding by itself. Okay, in terms of documentation, um, again, uh, a good template is uh, crucial. So it should be set up already um, uh, for all your working drawings, but you should actually work in working view. So a lot of people out there will actually set up the sheets themselves and then uh, activate the sheet and work within the sheet itself. Uh, don't do that, that's a mistake. You should set up your uh, working, working view so you actually work in that particular model and you have the sheets actually populate uh, automatically. Um, you should every sheet in your template should already be set up. So you can see on the right here, uh, I've got a system where every, you know, even if I don't use like 350 sheets all set up and I just use the ones that I want and they automatically populate and they just use them when I want to. Again, that doesn't take up very much file space at all. It's a bit like a Word document. It's, it's very small. It's actually the, the Revit families that take up uh, that take up all the room. Of course, each of those sheets is set up with uh, multiple sheets with graphic overrides on each of them. So that the um, you know, dashed, you can see here the dashed uh, lines for the roof uh, update and so on and so forth. 
Other things that you need to look at is um, keynoting, uh, automating your tags, uh, having view templates so that in the event that uh, your 350 sheets don't do it and you need a 351, you can use the view templates to um, set them up. Phase, having phases set up for existing buildings and lifts and shifts is, is really important. Uh, lots of standard notes. Uh, again, my standard notes are all on the drawings. Um, and then uh, use instructions. So you have um, a standard QA ac across, your, across your office. Um, and then the other thing is uh, simple things like North Points. Uh, Peter, he is the, the brains behind this organization. And uh, I keep saying, oh, I need another scale bar, I need another scale bar. So his is actually a tick, tick of 17 different scale bars. So I don't have to worry about mucking around with those. Okay. Now, the problem is with Revit and possibly with some of the other software, um, although you know, SketchUp is really much easier, I think, to learn. Flexible's mu uh, Revit's much harder to learn, but it's much more useful when you actually get into it. So harder to learn, more flexibility. My actual uh, Revit software sat in the box for three years because I just didn't have time to learn it. Uh, training was expensive. I couldn't do it at night. And while I was learning, I wasn't earning. Um, and so uh, it was just like too hard, too hard, which is basically what started me on this journey of um, oh, let's educate as many people as I can to try and make the process easier for them. So now I've actually got um, all my sheets all set up. I've actually got instructions on each sheet. So you can see here by example, we've got what we call green notes, which basically remind me how I use the sheet, what it's there for, how to use it. Uh, and that hyperlinks to the, um, the manual itself in case it needs further explanation. Uh, so this allows um, you know, any staff that I have uh, to know exactly what happens on each of those sheets. So basically it's a built-in training system, great for people straight out of uni. So here's another key tip for everybody. If you're gonna do anything more than once, you do it twice, work out some way to automate it and systemize, systemize, systemize. Uh, computers are supposed to stop with repetitive tasks. So uh, it ceases, never ceases to amaze me when people that use computers and do uh, repetitive tasks, that's what they're best to do. And again, a good template will do 80% um, of the heavy lifting. Sorry guys, I talk fast. Okay. Now, to me, this is the key. This is the key of BIM, is using 3D to increase income. Uh, what I do at the pre-design stage is uh, I basically model, uh, uh, do everything as a 3D model, and but it's useless unless you can print it, you can share it and get paid for it. Um, so everybody will do that fairly quickly. I use uh, nominal walls, uh, no doors and windows, uh, no textures, so, uh, and just work in my working model and automatically populates my PD sheets. Um, that includes AXA views and, and uh, what else have you. So um, it's basically a space planning, space planning envelope, send that off, give the client a bill, show them how smart we are and what we've been doing. Then uh, sketch design, we actually switch to generic walls. Um, color, switch them on to color, sorry, so on generic walls, we switch them to color. Supply a few more views, um, but this one on the right here is actually the view from, um, from the site and clients love that sort of stuff. Um, and then if you automatically set up your sheets for site cover, GFA, shadow views, perspectives, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's just a matter of printing out your 20 sheets and send them an invoice. Uh, effectively showing them that you've been doing all this design work uh, rather than one perspective, you give them lots of information to show how hard you've been working. Uh, at develop design or um, town planning stage, <clears throat> I usually change it to a real wall, real wall type, include textures and colors in a realistic mode. Um, invariably with sun diagrams and axo views and perspectives. Um, Again, a good family is really, really important. I think in native, native Revit is actually good uh, to actually uh, give it some kind of rendering, some kind of representation without spending um, lots of time and effort on um, rendering. I know rendering seem to be a little bit fashionable at the moment, but as far as I'm concerned, this one's gonna pay me a lot more money to have some photorealistic rendering than uh, online interested. In fact, when I started, 10, 15 years ago, I used to do fly-throughs and walk rounds and high and renders used to take overnight or two nights, two days, and you'd find a tree in the way or something like that. It was it was a nightmare. And now to do it in five minutes is an absolute joy. But I've actually realized that the clients got, got too attached to the presentation itself uh, as opposed to the design. So I think dumbing it down a little bit um, is, is probably a good thing. 
otherwise they just get attached to you know, the color of a wall or something. <clears throat> At uh, work and drawing stage, I flip back to black and white. Um, everything's still documented in 3D, add the schedules, uh, 3D axos, make sure all the details are in 3D, not 2D if you can uh, uh, avoid it, and then uh, print the 30 sheets uh, or whatever and uh, send the invoice. Um, I've got a project at the moment that's uh, 157 sheets, so uh, that's fun. Okay, so leveraging 3D to earn more. Uh, back in the days uh, when you had 2Ds, it used to be lots and lots of work. I was almost guilty of trying to talk clients out of changes, I think, because it was just so much work for me, which I invariably wasn't going to get paid for. Uh, in, in essence, 3D, uh, you change the make one change, it changes the 3D model on every sheet, so you've got 350 sheets they're made. Changing levels is much easier, moving the buildings easily. So you can finally get paid for all the hard work that you do as designers. Um, and to me, this is the power of it. We can actually show the clients that we're, we're being paid for design, um, not for just uh, work and drawings. Um, also, I don't lose money on changes. Uh, clients come in and I go, yep, I can change that, no worries. And you can make all these changes for them in 10 minutes. And in the old days, it used to take you uh, weeks. And, and you almost have to hold to before you send off another bill because it was so easy. But finally, we can get paid for our design skills. Um, sure, we've got to pay for expensive software, expensive hardware. We've got to learn how to use the software. We've got to make our own Revit libraries. We've got to pay for training. We've got to pay for the subscriptions. So again, that's why I use native views and don't do renderings because I'm not going to get paid sufficient money for it. If you can, good, do it. So uh, I talked about the fact that no one actually shares because all the architects seem to think that we're all competitors. Uh, I'm a different view. I think a rising tide lifts all the boats. So at ASPG, I, we all share with each other and I've got a real collaborative attitude with uh, my architect friends. Um, so you've really got three options. So um, first of all, you can create a list yourself, find the families yourself, set it all up yourself and invest your time and money into it or find someone else who'll actually share it with you. Uh, I found, finally found someone who wasn't an architect, he was a, some software guy. He wanted five grand just for a template. And I can tell you now his template was about one tenth as good as what mine is now. And uh, so this wasn't worth that kind of money. And that's what got me started thinking, well, this is wrong. Why are we all spending this time and money and effort and wasting this, uh, it's hitting to our profit. We should all be collaborating and working together to increase the profit for everybody. Um, or you can subscribe to a system uh, you know, and let that person be the sat nav and, and, and get you there, uh, get you there faster. Now we're going for time. Better keep rocking along, hey? Okay, so that's how actually uh, Quark system was actually created. Um, I, Peter actually had some stuff. He decided he'd um, share it with me and I could see the benefit of um, sharing it with everybody else. So, and end up being his beta tester and saying, well, this is good. Why can't we do this? And why can't we do that? And Peter would often say, no, nah, it's not possible. And then he'd work all weekend and come back and say, yes, we can. So uh, together with him and uh, all of our staff, we, uh, which were like, like 150 years of experience, we decided, let's see what we can come up with. And of course that meant that he had to compromise on his system and I had to compromise on mine on the basis um, that if it's not that important, let it go. So we solved all these problems. First thing we did was we had uh, 9,000 uh, things in our library in which we went back and said, these aren't good enough and we rebuilt all those. Uh, we subsequently created a plugin for Revit so we can drag and drop stuff uh, straight from the cloud into a project. We have the best project templates I've ever seen with all the sheets uh, already set up. We've actually come up with a uh, alphanumeric numbering system so the numbers stay exactly the same on every project. It's just a job number that changes. So that makes it easier to find whatever you're looking for, even if you've got 150 sheets. Uh, automatic notes and scheduling of tags. And uh, uh, and the, um, we have a uh, search function uh, for our content, so we can get at that. It's available in 2020 to 23 versions. And um, it's been for use for design for use on any project. Uh, and of course, as I said before, we have how-to guides on every single sheet. And we even have check sheets for our junior staff. So we spent a lot of, lot, lot of time in this and uh, it's cost us a huge amount of time, but I've got to be honest and say that my, I make money out of architecture now because of my automated systems. Um, so 
It's obviously a system like uh, Quark will increase productivity. Uh, don't want to sales pitch too much because I'm just telling you these are the things you need to find if you're going to uh, find an alternative. Um, no one else offers a complete system for Australians. We actually struggled with feet and inches and American stuff and uh, stuff from all over the place. And um, But you need to do your own research, go out there and find out what the uh, software people are providing, particularly if you're on, um, uh, say, for example, uh, SketchUp, uh, there's a mob in Perth. They've done a brilliant add-ons for a SketchUp called um, Pluspec. Uh, so the guy's done a brilliant job with that. Have a look what's around there for your particular software. His is particularly for um, specy buildings, but uh, brilliant, brilliant stuff. He's done what we've done for Revit for SketchUp, so it's really, really good. Um, obviously, you can get um, you know, there's other people will offer you window packages and door packages and wall packages and stuff like that. Uh, you need to do your own investigations and that. And some people actually sell templates as well. Not a lot of training available these days, which is why we've got um, 32 training videos and <clears throat> a huge, a huge manual just to make that all possible to do at home at night. And of course, manufacturers should be giving you content as well, but um, not a lot of them are really giving you good content at the moment. Some of the um, windows and door manufacturers, their files are just huge. And when you zoomed in and have a look, they've done every screw and every uh, grommet in there, and it just makes the files too big, which we don't need. At one is to 100, it becomes a big black blob. So it's pretty useless to you. So, um, so if you've got a system like we have at Quark here, turbocharges Revit, basically takes your car from being uh, normal to a turbocharger because it automates everything. Um, we make really good documents, so you can have a look at them on the website. Been, around, been developing it for 10 years. We've um, been testing it for 12. We've got 30 beta users who are now subscribers. Uh, One-stop shop for Australian Revit families and access to manufacturer's content via our free plugin, which I'll tell you about. So uh, Quark saved me about two hours a day. Sorry, it's about 25 grand, easily, easily that. Now our dearest package, we've got seven packages, 30 bucks a week. So that's a cup of coffee a day. So, so the obvious question is why are we doing it so cheap? And it's basically because Pete and I are getting old and we got really, really frustrated and thought, this is not right. Uh, everyone should be sharing this stuff. We're passionate designers, passionate documenters. And we thought, well, if we can get everyone together, um, surely um, we can actually make it cheaper and, and make every architect make more money. So, and even to that end, if um, you guys decide to go with us, it's a 10% discount for AIA members as well. But there's even more opportunities, I think. Um, since COVID, we see a lot of people working from home. Um, and so I've got the sort of a dream that if we can get hundreds of architects using a system like Quark, it doesn't have to be Quark, it can be any system as long as we're all sharing with each other. And we have standard systems and standard templates. That's going to allow us to have part-time workers that can work from home. Um, carers living at home that uh, are basically kicked out of the workforce because, or, and you know, hit the glass ceilings because they can't work from home. If you've got a standard system in your office, you can have lots of staff working from home part-time from in the country um, because you can pick up the documents at any time, you know where everything is and you can work on it yourself. And then they can work on it at night, weekends, what else have you. I think it's a great opportunity for this collaboration. Um, bigger offices could actually standardize their systems and work together on bigger projects they would not normally work on by themselves. Um, but more importantly, a systemized business, I think is a saleable business. Um, a lot of us get frustrated. We have staff, we bring them in, we train them up. And after we train them up one or two years, they get that extra knowledge and go work somewhere else and demand higher pay because they're trained up. Um, whereas if you bring them into your system and, and they're using a system and you're using the system, there's a good chance that they'll stay with your business because uh, you're attracting the next generation of your evolving practice um, and provides them with a workable, a flexible workspace. They can work at home, work at night. On the flip side, if you're a recent graduate, you could actually bring that system into an office, which makes you more employable. So um, anyway, so we actually offer a free Explorer package, uh, which gives you access to our manufacturers online and, uh, and, and also our um, a limited version of our library. I think it's 800 or something like that. So the more you pay, the more access you get to a bigger library. So, um, but also, um, there'll be a, a link on here somewhere which links to my ebook. Um, it's a little bit out of date because we we come up with some um, new products since I actually did the ebook. Um, one of them, and we're always just whatever money we get, this business we put back into. So we've just created a new thing called um, BIM Locker, which allows you to bring in your favourites 
from a family farm and uh, save it on the cloud and use our drag and drop um, uh, technology to bring that into your projects. That's pretty exciting. That's a, a totally separate package as well. Um, okay, so I've got any of those links, you can get in uh, contact with um, Tamara. Hey, I'm ahead of schedule. It was an absolute miracle. I know I talk really fast. But, uh, <laughs> I probably missed a whole lot of stuff, but um, I think I think probably the best thing. Um, oh, we can do Q and A now as well. Um, but I think if you give your give everyone your direct contact so that they can have a chat to you a bit more about it. Um, so we might, Joel, you've got them phone numbers and email addresses. We might pop that in the chat bar for everyone. Um, but yeah, we'll open up now and do a Q and A. Hey, hey, Mark. I will. Um, the, the chat. The chat bar has been going gang gangbusters. Um, it has. There's a lot of questions in there. There's a heap. Oh, there's a heap. Of... I can see one already. Does it work on Revit LT? We can't justify the cost of full Revit. So I just happened to stumble upon that one, and uh, so I'll answer that. Um, now, unfortunately, it, it doesn't work on Revit LT. And part of the reason is Autodesk um, tell me that they lose money on Revit LT. It's actually a lost leader for them. Um, so they basically give it out cheap so people would eventually upgrade to full Revit. And of course, the only reason you would do that is to get access to all the plugins in which they have um, lots of people um, doing plugins like us and everyone else. So that's their justification. Um, from my point of view, um, what, what Quark actually does on the full Revit, you've got to pay for the full Revit, but it, it supercharges um, and just leverages Revit to 10 times the speed that um, it actually justifies uh, paying for Quark. I don't know if it justifies paying for the extra money for uh, full Revit. So it's one of those things. So I, I, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. Uh, but of course, once you're on full Revit, you have access to all the other plugins as well. So um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, and then there's another one here. Uh, so can we pay for it monthly? Um, uh, and we can't actually do that at the moment. Um, uh, the actual financial arrangements cost more than the software itself. It's just ridiculous, all that stuff. So, um, so no, I can't do that. Yep. Um, hey, Mark, there's there's been a bit of back and forth about Archicad here, which has been fascinating. Yep. Um, um, Nathan Hildebrandt says he can help people with um, uh, Archicad um, template systems. Yep. But it's fascinating. Mark and I have talked to lots of other Archicad users, and we've come to the conclusion that one day Quark should make a Quark for Archicad. Um, watch this space. Oh, I think Nathan. I think probably Nathan actually fits into that space. He 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 knows Archicad very well, and he's probably a really good example of someone that does um, what we do for Revit. He pretty much does for Archicad. Uh, he's a very good, uh, very good presenter, and knows his product very well. So. Good. Maybe we should talk to Nathan, Mark. Yep. Yep. Um, back up here, um, there was a, a there was a couple of questions when Mark, you particularly talked about everything should be in three D, and you know both of us agree on this. Um, some people answered that with saying, "Do as much as you need to." Um, we would suggest that's not necessarily the best idea, because if you hand the file to someone else in your office. They've got zero idea of what you've done in 2D on views. You be, you, the best idea with Revit is model more, draft less. And that's what Mark was trying to get you to understand. So, yeah. Look, absolutely. And I've been in that process myself because I've come from that background. Quite often you, you get this little project and you think, look, oh, it's just a little 2D draw up thing. I could just draw it in 2D and, you know, it's got to be much quicker to do it that way. But um, interesting enough, I had... Um, some, a project that I'd done previously and uh, it took me about two weeks to actually draw it up in 2D CAD because it was 10, 15 years old or something. I remember what a pain it was because there was so much detailing up and I thought, oh, I should just be able to trace this. It'd be much easier. I'm not going to build it in 3D. Anyway, I bit the bullet and said, oh, okay, I'll do it in 3D. And uh, the next day I'd finished it. Mm. It's like, you couldn't have believed it. You know, it was like, wow, that's, you know, next day, mm. crazy. So even I wasn't believed it was, was worth it, but every time I question it and do it, it's like, yep. And as soon as you make one change to it, um, all that is all justified. Here's another question about AS 1100. Um, Mark and I have spent a fair whack of time 
trying to understand how to implement AS 1100 throughout um, documentation for a long time. And we would contend that AS 1100 has actually been out of date for about 30 years. Um, it reflected hand drawing from 30 years ago, and it hasn't actually updated very well. But we in Quark, we've tried to make sure that our template system actually does match as much as we can. And this comes back to what Mark was telling you all about, trying to have a systemized methodology across several offices by sharing is better than trying to follow AS 1100, we would suggest. Yeah, um, I think that's going to be part of the problem when uh, the government legislates for all this stuff. Uh, and Nathan will know all about this is, is um, what government's going to want from uh, Archicad and, and SketchUp and everything else and which standards and level of design and all that sort of stuff. Um, getting a bunch of government to try and agree to that, I think it's going to take us 20 years. <laughs> I think Nathan's yes. done a lot of work in that regard, but it's not an easy, not an easy exercise, I'm sure he'd agree. Um, Julian has asked us, can we do a live demonstration? Sorry, not enough time. We, we need another hour and that could be another session. Oh, that's um, what I think that's, what, that's perhaps a suggestion. We could probably actually do that at some time. But yeah, certainly get in contact with me on Peter and it's something we probably need to do uh, at some stage in the future. I'm happy uh, to run another session, um, yeah. like a second session and uh, as a demo session. And we could cool. do that pretty quickly if you wanted. Well, once I think once this gets up on YouTube, we'll see what, what gauges the kind of interest. And if people are interested in doing a, a live session, we'll actually do that. Yeah. Interesting, interesting enough, uh, I've actually attended um, uh, uh, 3D races where, where um, they've actually had um, SketchUp, uh, Archicad, and Revit uh, so you can document, design and document something the fastest. And uh, of course, we cheated because we used Quark. So that made Revit win. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, but without, it, it, without Quark, we wouldn't have won. So, um, yeah. Um, um, there's another question here, Mark. So all ones to 10 details should be drawn in 3D. Now, you, you can answer that because you're a master at this. Yeah, okay. Well, you're going to catch me out here a little bit. Um, that's, that's the point. We, we want to we, we want to admit to what you can do and what you should do. So obviously, obviously, it gets to a point uh, where you just think, "Hang on, detailing that up in three D is is just um, too much, too far." And I am guilty of it myself in the sense that. Um, but what I do do is I actually zoom into the three D model and zoom right into it and actually override the graphics to make it very, very light in the background and literally draw draw the two D there. That does two things: it makes sure that the two Ds are actually accurate representations and uh, not like the old hand sketches of architects, which actually didn't reflect what really happens on site. Um, but the problem with that, of course, is if you do change the model, that um, particular 3D view um, you know, tends to uh, move and you've got to update it. So that's why I say, uh, don't do it, don't do it. But I am guilty of doing, I'm just saying, these are the rules. When you break them, be aware that you're breaking them. Um, hey, Mark, a um, couple of people have mentioned they'd love to have a, a full-on demonstration like you alluded to, which we've done before, Mark. Um, but we'd have, we'll have to set up a, a whole session somewhere and put a whole pile of people in the room and just have fun watching. Yeah. Um, Tamara might have to look at that with, jo with Joel. I think, I think for those people that are remotely interested, and I think the first thing you should do is, is go to the, uh, and register for the Quark Explorer. Um, it's actually, as I say, it's free to access to the seven manufacturers that are on board. Um, and it's got an introductory template. So it's a real taste tester of what's available. Obviously doesn't use the, soft, the software, but um, it shows you in the background. So do that first. And it actually gives you the introductory template, 800 Revit family items. So again, that's free for you for, what, for nothing. Um, it actually lets you store of your, 50 of your favorite items on the cloud using BIM Locker. So that's just, gold as far as I'm concerned. It's one of the things I asked Peter for for six years before we actually um, paid a software guy to create it. So that's absolute gold. That's for free. Um, and if you want to try any of the full features of, of Revit, um, subscribe for a year. In essence, you basically get then the good template, you get access to all the families. And uh, it's at risk as with us then, it's sort of like, um, if you don't come back, you steal all that stuff off us, that's fine. But we figure that you'll see so much benefit, you want to see the continuous and constant upgrades that we actually get to it. 
So, uh, so do that, you know, it's free. It's, it's like a try before you buy. Hey, Mark, we've had quite a few comments about Vectorworks and, I, and we will have to admit that we don't know a lot about Vectorworks. Um, we, we don't know how to compare it. So we might have to take that questions on notice. Uh, a lot of Archicad people on networks, I think. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know, but there'll have to be um, yeah, something we'd have to look at. All different software. Okay. Um, there was another question here, Mark, about um, transitioning from Revit to, from another platform. Um, we. Someone stopped the dentist there or what? <laughs> Sorry, Pete. Yes, I've got someone standing the house outside me. I'm going to mute myself. I can't get the question then, Pete. So the question was, is oh. there any advice on practice transitioning to Revit from a different platform? Ah, hmm, now that's a really good question. Um, obviously, it depends on the software. So what's interesting about it is you think that if you're on one type of 3D software, then transitioning to uh, Revit, for example, would be fairly seamless and easy and in fact it, if you're my if you're a young person um you know anything before I'm a, a millennial you're fine but if you're an old person like me it is painful because your brain is actually mapped in a certain direction so changing from uh, uh, the three times I change software you do one thing in one so for example uh, trimming you'd actually click it and you'd click the bit you want to trim off whereas in Revit you do the opposite you click the bit you want to keep and so you're just constantly having to remap your brain. And I found it very frustrating when I had a junior staff person work for me. She was brilliant in the sense that nothing really phased her. She just went, oh, and I'd get really upset over it and go, stupid software, stupid software. But so, yes, it's a bit painful. I think the only advice I can get is um, if you're actually using one, it's just like changing from hand drawing. Keep using your old software because you still got to make money out of it. And you've got to keep producing, but then start with a pilot project, which hopefully doesn't have a, a ridiculous time line on it, something in your own house or something else, a relative that gives you time to actually learn it and um, bed into the process and run that parallel while you're still making money. And at some stage, you just change what jump horses midstream and where you go. Um, you, you, you can't, I, I think it's really brave. And it, that, that's, that, I think that's the objective um, answer, um, of course, Part of the reason we came up with Quark is to make you speed that process from when you get on Revit, the learning process is 12 months, 18 months to two years before it actually starts making your money. If you get on Quark and you're not making money in three months, you're just not, you're just not looking at the videos, you're just not learning. It just, it means you only have to learn 25% of Revit. There's lots of stuff in Revit that uh, Pete knows and I have no idea because I just basically, um, uh, backward analyze the stuff that's on the sheets and go, how they do that, has done that. And yeah, for example, one do a, um, a site plan. It's already set up with all the meets and bounds. And I just basically pick on that and I retrack it and, and it automatically updates. Uh, the other day I got something and I didn't even uh, forgotten that on Revit there's a property boundary um, software thing you can use, which I don't use. I don't use half the stuff on there because my template's already set up. All the, all the hard work's been done. Um, and so it makes that learning process much quicker. Um, but also, second tip, if you've got a young person in your office that's working on the new software, that's a really good tip if you're old like me and stuck in your ways. Uh, they just make it, they, they, they embrace the technology and don't get frustrated. Mind you, we're paying their bills. We're paying for them. So they're getting, <laughs> it's, it's not costing them as much. But good question, very good question. Any more? We haven't had any more in the chat so far. Um, yeah, so the other thing I've got, I've got one here. Uh, can I try before I buy? Um, you can access the uh, free drag and drop browser off that Explorer, which I said about, and, and get the smart manufacturers. And that also includes students. So if you've got students uh, who are on a, a software as well, uh, it won't probably won't work on pirated software, but if students got legitimate and student versions, it'll still work because Autodesk actually um, checks your, your 360 license. So again, when you're using software like our plugin, once you've logged into 360, you're automatically logged into Quark. And so there's no extra hoop you have to jump through. It's already checked uh, your licenses and you're, it's all good. Okay. Uh, no one's asked, does it work for every kind of project? 
So we've actually got um, some samples on our, our website, uh, pixels that need to update my latest one, which is 10 million on there to show that it can be done. We believe that our standard drawing templates set up for 100 story buildings and uh, we've got one of our users is about to use it on, a, I think, 90 townhouses. So uh, we'll, we'll test it and see if it works. But again, if it doesn't work, he'll tell us and we'll fix it. Uh, that's the beauty about having me and Peter and our coders here in Brisbane, not uh, overseas somewhere. So if something doesn't work, we get on the phone, we meet and we fix it. It's basically about, I'm the one that basically breaks most of the stuff and comes up with the new ideas, but if there's anyone else on the system, I go, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's, let's do that, Pete. <laughs> so unlike uh, Autodesk, for example, you pay for the new version of Revit every year and invariably the improvements are fairly minor. So we've had two more questions in the chat. So yep. do your training videos in uh, QArc suit users completely new to Revit or do you need some basic ex experience with the platform? That's a good question, Pete. Um, there's, uh, I guess the short answer is uh, go and have a look. There's 32 videos there. Uh, I'd say some of them, um, some of them for novice users, but I think most of them and they're probably more orientated about Quark users than Revit users because, as I say, Quark, um, we get rid of 75% of the learning curve because it automates stuff. So if I can answer that question, it probably won't help you get better at Revit, but it would help you get better at Revit if you had Quark. Hey, Mark, I've got, I've got no noise outside now. I can add to what Mark said. We have tested a few of our users, uh, one in particular who went, would you believe, he's, out, he's older than Mark and me, he went from the board, straight to Revit using Quark. We were stunned and amazed how quickly he became proficient. It was less than three months. Um, and I think it was simply because we gave him enough training via the videos and, you know, the system worked for, for him. Yeah. And, I, well, and, that, and that's part of my dream. We've got enough Quark, student Quark users out there. We've got 50 or 100 student Quark users. They come into your office and you, you employ them and help you to transition to Quark, then um, you're going to get there really, really fast. So that's it's a great opportunity for those people and also the stay-at-home people. What else have you? I just want to mention um, on that on our last page, which is on the video that's still up, you see we've got a little value matrix there. Uh, there you can actually see that. Um, uh, well, there'll be a link on that to the website. You can actually go through and very, very quickly see in quite detail uh, what you get for each of the packages, and um, we've associated a. Uh, a value for them and you can see what extremely good value uh, what we've done and what we're offering but um, uh, anyway that's something you can have a look at and see what might suit you but um, go ahead and get the free one so we had another question is there a database of graduates that use QARC and also does your package create BOQ also Okay, um, I'm, I'm not aware if there's a database of graduates, it's probably a privacy thing, issue anyway. Um, I'm not the sort of person that would go and hunt them. I'm, Peter and I have always been a little bit, people will find out about Quark and they'll come to us once they find out how good it is. We actually had a change of that view when I woke up one morning and said, you know, Pete, um, people aren't hearing about us and a lot of people are missing out. So let's get actively um, out there and promote this particular, but we sort of didn't care because it makes our, our businesses more profitable if you like. Uh, I, we couldn't have time to actually create Quark if Quark didn't make my business more profitable to give me the money to spend the time playing around with Quark. Um, so database, don't know, uh, but we are actively trying to pursue that a bit more because we think it's a real benefit to the student because a lot of them uh, actually aren't taught a lot of stuff. I don't know if you know, but a lot of them have got to go off to TAFE and learn Revit and, uh, and for their presentations, and although some of them aren't accepted if they're hand-drawn. So Again, if we can get them on Quark, it makes that process easier for them. In terms of bill of quantities, um, that's an interesting one. It's actually on our um, roadmap. We've got so much stuff on our roadmap, it's not funny. It's one of the things that we actually want to do. Um, we are actively pursuing that. Um, I think in terms of it's um, maybe from, if I say that probably if we had more users on board, we'd have a little bit more money and we could spend some time actually investigating that next thing. The, 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 the opportunities are there. And again, that's using the power of the computer um, to do that. Um, so yeah, it's been on the list for a long time. There so we, we have a few more questions in the chat. So, Nick asks, can the QR templates be adjusted to suit in-place Office templates? 
And uh, there's also another one that says, would you provide student version to get the plugin more exposure? Uh, again, the um, again the students can get access to the um, Explorer one for free, which gives you a limited access. Uh, apart from that, it's like um, um, you know, how much do you give away? I suppose. Um, the other question was what was the first, the first part of that question was so. Uh, can QR templates be adjusted to suit in-place Office templates? Um, yeah, well, obviously, yes, any template can be altered however you suit. Uh, I would, it's not, it's not, it's not our preference. Uh, what we'd actually, because what we, the way our system is set up is Pete and I are constantly updating the master template. So the way it actually works is when you start a project, you go to the new master template, which we could have, we could have modified the day before. And then you actually open that up uh, for your next project. So there's nothing's carried out in the previous project. So if you do try and meld your template with our template, every time we update it, you've got to go back and do that. And it's a fairly arduous process. I think the better process is uh, if you've got a good idea where our template is actually deficient, let us know. Because if it's good for you, it's probably good for a lot of people. And then we'll we'll look at incorporating. If it's a good idea, we'll put it in there. It's about sharing that, that rising tide, you know. If it's a super secret thing and it makes your template better, well, fine, keep that. But you know, I like the I like the idea of uh, there's only two, there's only you know sort of five or six of us. But uh, if there's uh, fifty other people, out, someone's got a good idea. If it works for you, it's a good chance it works for us. And it saves us time, saves us money, and everyone else. Great, let's share it. All right. So we are at one o'clock now. So I think we'll end it here. But um, thank you for the excellent presentation today, Mark and Peter. And thank you everyone for taking the time out of your day to attend this member lean-in. Uh, apologies again for the time zone confusion. Uh, the YouTube link will be in our national use newsletter once it's finalized. And please also keep an eye out for the second session that will be coming up. Hope everyone has a great day and thank you for the feedback and questions. Uh, before you go, Joel, so this, yep. um, these uh, chat room stuff, have you got that all captured so I can because I obviously was talking so fast, I didn't have a chance to have a look at that on the way through. Uh, yes, yeah, we, I, we, sh we should have the uh, chat room all captured with all the questions. Yeah, so usually when you download um, out of Zoom, Joel, you'll get the video recording and then you'll get the chat room transcript as well. Yep, awesome. Great. Thanks so much, right. Peter. Thanks, Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Hope you all Thanks, got Mark. something out of that. Good luck. Fantastic presentation as always. I'm a big fan of your product. I hope, um, yeah, people will have a look at it and give it a go. Um, if you can't get a hold of Mark or Pete, feel free to reach out to myself or Joel and we'll put you in contact. Um, yeah, I think we'll run another session again in a few months um, and we could possibly include in that um, a bit of a live demo as well. So thank you very much for today. Thanks, Mike. Right. Thanks, Peter. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Pete.